Hello and welcome to Third and Zen. My name is Richard Santoro and I welcome you today to my channel where my plan is to share my messages, my sermons, my spiritual journey over the last 20 years. Today what I'd like to do is share with you the first sermon that I ever gave almost 20 years ago, July 2003. I was young and fresh-eyed and all that stuff and this was the first sermon that I ever wrote and it's called Great Things Are Possible and I've already immediately discovered as I start to do this in chronological order that it's going to be a challenge for me to look back on things that I used to think and write and then say to other people do I agree with it all do I still feel that way how have I changed how have, how have my how has my outlook changed well this message I did alter a little bit. I trimmed a lot of fat off it. I trimmed a lot of things off it. But I will say this, the heart of it, what made this message, the message that it is, is still there. So with that being said, thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to taking this journey and I thank you for taking it with me. So this is a message from 2003 entitled, Great Things Are Possible. So before I get started with that, why don't we all take a nice deep breath. <sighs> take a moment and just breathe. Settle into your chair. Maybe release any tension that you didn't know you were holding in your body, maybe in your face, in your brow, in your jaw, in your shoulders. Just breathe. Let the seat and the chair couch, wherever you are, support you and be mindful of that. And just let's do our best to be present, to be still, to be open. Deep breath. And let's get started. This is a sermon entitled Great Things Are Possible. You know, we often tell kids that they need to reach for the stars. And we let them know in an encouraging way that they can do anything that they want to in life if they just put their mind, their heart, their soul, their energy, their effort into it, that they can do anything they want to in this world. Well, I think that what we really need to do in addition to that is that we often need to remind adults of this same thing. Kids hopefully often feel like they can do anything they want to, but we adults, we lose that somewhere along the way, don't we? Life has a way of sometimes dragging us down. We get scared to take risks. We just seem to think sometimes that this is all there is. This is all it'll ever be. So we sometimes just tend to maybe get stuck in the mud a little bit. Really, often, we lack the courage to believe that it's never too late to take risks. It's never too late for us to accomplish some truly great things with our life and with God as our partner. Often, we struggle to have faith in ourselves and we struggle to trust in God and in what is possible with God and with us doing great things in this world together. Now, this struggle, this lack of courage and trust in ourselves as individuals and as human beings and in that partnership with God, it's not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for human existence, basically. You know, I'm reminded of scripture and the gospels and the relationship that Jesus had during his three-year ministry with his disciples, where they followed him around and they listened to him and they listened to his preaching and his teaching and they saw him miracle after miracle, an amazing event after amazing event. And I'm reminded of John's gospel alone, the feeding of the multitudes, the loaves and the fishes, where Jesus is there with his disciples. He's there with the masses, and he turns to his disciples and he says, you know, we got some hungry people here. How are we going to feed them? And despite what the disciples have seen up to this point, 
the changing of the water to wine at the wedding of Cana, and all, all other miracles and amazing events that Jesus took place in, that he did, and yet they still doubt, they still wonder. They still have that moment of lack of trust where Jesus is inviting them to be in partnership with him to do something amazing, and they have that moment of pause. But the redeeming factor in this moment and in so many of those scriptural moments with Jesus and the disciples is that they looked to Jesus. That's the thing that we must not forget. In the end, in so many of those moments, they asked Jesus for the answer. How are we going to do this? How are you going to do this? And of course, he always had the answer. They always looked to Jesus. They knew well enough that the answer was with Jesus, that the answer was Jesus. You know, sometimes like the disciples, like so many people, we can have all the faith in the world and we can have all the gifts and opportunities to do great things, to do good things that this world has to offer. But still, often, we decide to do our own thing, to go our own way. And often this happens not just because, as I mentioned, a lack of faith in ourselves and a lack of trust in God and that relationship and a lack of courage. But often we go our own way or we give up trying to do great and wonderful things in this world because we can be so results-oriented. That if we don't see the fruits of our labor and our energy and our efforts, we stop. We give up. We go our own way. Maybe we pivot a little bit away from God in the process. We lack the courage sometimes. We lack the trust and the faith in ourselves, in, our, in God, and in that relationship. And we get discouraged by a lack of tangible, visible results. Well, let me pause here for a moment. I want to tell you a story that a friend passed on to me that will really illustrate what it is that I'm trying to say. Because, again, we need to have faith in ourselves. We need to have faith and trust in God. And we need to remember that it's not just these giants of history that can do great and wonderful things in this world, that it's also us as well. So let me share this story that a friend once passed on to me. One Sunday morning at a Baptist church in London, a pastor was finishing up the worship service when a man raised his hand and said that he was new to the church and said that he'd like to give his testimony. The pastor said, you've got three minutes. The man proceeded and said, one day I was walking in Sydney, Australia, in the heart of the business district down on George Street. And this courteous, little, old, white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway and said, Son, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? Well, I was astounded by that. Nobody had ever asked me that question before, or a question of that nature before. This stayed with me for quite a while. The first thing I did when I got back home to England was go and see a friend, and he led me to God. And here I am a year later. Everybody applauded and welcomed him to the church. That same Baptist preacher flew down to Adelaide, Australia the next week. And during a conference at a Baptist church, a woman came to him for counseling. And he wanted to establish where she stood on her spiritual journey and in her relationship with Jesus. She said, I used to live down in Sydney. And just a couple of months back, I was visiting some friends. And while shopping down on George Street, this strange little white-haired man, old man stepped out of a shop doorway. He offered me a pamphlet and said, Excuse me, ma'am, but are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? She said, I was very disturbed by these words. When I returned here to Adelaide, I knew this Baptist church that was on the next block. I went there, I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Jesus. Now, this preacher was uh, pretty puzzled at this moment. Twice within a short span of time, he had heard the same testimony 
about a little white-haired old man down on George Street. Sometime after, this preacher went to another Baptist church down in Perth, Australia. That evening, he went out to eat with a senior elder from the church. He asked the elder, mate, how did you get saved? Well, I grew up in this church, but never really made a commitment to Jesus. I just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. Just three years ago, I was on a business outing in Sydney, and this obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a shop doorway and shoved a cheap piece of religious pamphlet in my face, and he accosted me with a question, Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? Well, I tried to tell him that I was a Baptist elder, but he wouldn't listen to me. I was seething with anger on my whole flight back to Perth. The first thing I did when I got home is I went to go see my pastor, thinking that he would sympathize with me. But he agreed with that man down on George Street. He said that he had been disturbed for years, knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And you know what? He was right. And my pastor led me to Jesus. And here I am. Now, over the course of the next three years, this London preacher heard numerous stories and testimonies about this man on George Street from all types, from missionaries in the Caribbean, from a former drunken sailor turned a naval chaplain, from a former diplomat turned Christian missionary. Finally, about three years after he heard that first testimony, this Baptist preacher from London was visiting a church again in Sydney, he asked the preacher there if he knew of this little elderly man who witnesses and hands out pamphlets down on George Street. And the man said, I do. His name is Mr. Genor, but he is too frail and elderly, and I don't think he does that anymore. The London preacher responded, I want to meet him. Two nights later, they went to an apartment, knocked on a door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. He welcomed them in and made them some tea. He was so sick and frail that he was shaking and slopping the tea as he carried it. This London preacher proceeded to tell Mr. Genor all the accounts that he had heard over the past three years. This little man sat there with tears streaming down his cheeks. He said, my story goes like this. Years ago, I was stationed on a warship. I lived a sinful life. When I hit a particularly hard time, a colleague to whom I had given literal hell came to my aid. And within 24 hours, he led me to Christ. I was so grateful to God that I promised the Lord that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day. And God gave me strength. I did it. Sometimes I was too ill to do it, but I made up for it on other days. I've done this, or had done this, for over 30 years. I'm sorry, over 40 years. And I found that the best place to do it was down on George Street. There were hundreds of people. I got lots of rejections. But a lot of people courteously took the pamphlets. And in over 40 years of doing this, I have never heard of one single person coming to Jesus because of me until this day. Mr. Genor died two weeks later. Forty years. Could you imagine that? Sheer commitment and devotion and absolute trust. This man was given a gift and an opportunity. He was given a call to spread the word of God and do his best to bring people to Jesus. He did not squander his gift or ignore it or do nothing. This man wasn't given a large, devoted congregation of church people to preach to, nor was he given a place in society to reach the masses. And this little man down on George Street was never given any assurances any tangible results to show him the fruits of his labor. But this man was given 
certain gifts, three gifts, his faith and his trust, his sense of duty to heed the call that God had placed upon him, and his pure gratitude and trust and love for Jesus. Boy, do the math. 40 years, 10 people a day. That's 146,000 people. And that's just the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Those lives touched other lives, and those lives touched others, and so on. You see, in the end, we can't all be called to lead great nations or large congregations. Not many of us are called to heal people or invent or make a large impact on great swaths of society or demographics or groups of people. Most of us aren't in positions of power to sway charities and affect huge change on a large communal basis. But that's okay. We can still trust and have faith in ourselves and trust and have faith in God. And we can still trust and have faith in that relationship that we can do and accomplish great things, even if it's just everyday small acts of kindness and random words of encouragement and love. Great things start with being good family members and good siblings, good partners or good parents. It starts with being good friends and good neighbors and good strangers to those that we will never see again. And it starts with simply being good people, kind people, generous with our gifts, our time, our kindness, our love. It starts with being slow to anger and quick to forgive. It starts with giving more and taking less. It starts with leading with love, with empathy, with compassion, with understanding. It starts with simply saying hello or smiling at a stranger. Watch a person's reaction as you say hello, as they pass, or as you smile at them. There will be those who look at you oddly and strangely or with a blank stare. But like Mr. Genard down on George Street, you will reach somebody. And you will see that light in their eye. And hopefully, they will then pass that light on to others and so on down the human chain. So, my friends, we do our best to have faith and to trust in ourselves and the tools and the gifts that we have and to share with others. As St. Paul famously wrote, that we may dwell and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we may be rooted and grounded in love. It's pretty simple. If we would like Jesus in our lives, He'll be there in our heart through faith, not through worry, not through stress, not through anxiety or angst or fear, through faith and trust, rooted and grounded in love. Love, that is the foundation. So again, we do our best. We do our best to trust. We do our best to have faith. We do our best to love one another and remember that we too can do great things. We too can reach for the stars and that we can use the power at work within us and be just like that little man down on Genner Street where Jesus 2,000 years ago, simply sharing love, a smile, and a kind word. It's there for all of us and we have the ability and the opportunity to do great things in relation with God and to do good things any moment it presents itself or any moment that we choose to make it real and tangible and just plant seeds of goodness. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. Again, my name is Richard. This has been Third and Zen. I thank you for being here and look forward to seeing you in the next video. Have a great day. Go in peace, my friends.